So it is Saturday, February 18th, uh, 2023. We are at the Calhoun Community Center. My name is Emily Santiana and I am interviewing. Uh, Nell Tinsman, actually I grew up as Flora Nell Seymour and then married a German and so I have a German last name, <laughs> even though I have very British Irish background. Thank you so much for being interviewed today. Um, first, I wanted to get a little bit of background on you. Um, where'd you grow up? What brought you to St. Augustine? Do you live here long term? Stuff like that. Well, actually, I grew up in St. Augustine. My family moved here in 1949 when I was six years old. So I guess you can figure out how old I am. Um, and grew up in St. Augustine, attended uh, local schools, Orange Street School, Catalina's High School, graduated St. Augustine High School. Was, after a couple of years of college, had a summer job in New York, stayed eight and a half years, then met my German husband, and ended up in three different countries in Europe. Moved back here about 18 and a half years ago for family purposes. My father passed away and my mother went into assisted living. And at the time she was 94 years old, we thought that we'd be going back to Europe and uh, four and a half years later, when she died at 98, um, we decided we were gonna stay, in, stay back in St. Augustine, Florida. All right, um, if you don't mind me asking, was history or the history of St. Augustine or your personal connection with it a motivation for you to stay instead of going back to Europe or other reasons? Well, it was primarily purpose, a, a, we, a, a solid decision because our children were living in different places. And if we went back to Europe, where would we go back to? Because Henny, my husband's family was in several different parts of Germany, for example, and our children were in different, different locations. And it just seemed to make sense to, to stay in St. Augustine where family could come and visit us and besides, my husband decided, German that he is, growing up in the cold weather, decided he liked the Florida sunshine and uh, the warmer weather. Yeah, can't blame him. Um, so a little bit before this interview, you spoke uh, a bit about your family history, specifically your father. Um, do you think you could give me some background on him, what he did, and what maybe historical significance he has in the area? Okay, my father was the Reverend Charles Milne Seymour, Jr. He, an Episcopal priest who was raised in Knoxville, Tennessee, but had uh, parishes in Tennessee, South Carolina before being asked to come to St. Augustine to be the rector at Trinity Episcopal Parish. Uh, some people may not know, but Trinity is over 200 years old and was first established in the, following the Spanish, British, Spanish back to American territory uh, and that's when the, the, the church was established. Uh, initially, the church was much smaller, and then a number of years later, I think in the early 1900s, they expanded the size of the church so that it was the altar was facing the east end of the building, and what was the original interest on, entrance on King Street, actually um, that part became a chapel. Um, my father was invited to become the rector um, in 1949. Uh, and it's very interesting, the, the story about how he got invited, because in today's Episcopal Church, there's a whole process you go through and you look at what you were, what is the congregation like? What would you like to see as your priest? What, you know, what would you like them to be like? What, what are your criteria? and also what do you think they might be expecting of you? Well, back in those days, it was, okay, well, let's see, the bishop would appoint. And so it turned out that my father had been, was in Aiken, South Carolina at the time, and he knew a priest who was in Augusta, Georgia. And I think they probably attended a lot of the uh, golf tournaments <laughs> um, together and who, and this particular priest, Hamilton West, became uh, the suffragan bishop in um, basically in Florida, in the Diocese of Florida. And so when all of a sudden they were asking around, you know, who would you recommend? My father's name came up on three lists. 
He happened to have a cousin who was on the vestry at Trinity, and he knew Hamilton West. And I believe he had even met uh, Bishop Duan, who was the bishop at the time as well. So it was sort of like, okay, Charlie Seymour, are you interested in coming to St. Augustine? And he said, yes. <laughs> and I think his family had been uh, visiting. He was one of eight children, and the family often had um, family gatherings in um, Atlantic Beach, at the old Atlantic Beach Hotel, one of those big old wooden structures. And I remember going there a few times myself. Uh, but anyway, and so my father came to St. Augustine. And he was there for basically 15 and a half years. And during the time he came, there were a number of the changes that were made. There was a, the church building, the, the, the parish hall was actually three stories high right next to the church, and which of course made it difficult if you were having coffee hour or something, if it wasn't out front, if you had to go up a flight of stairs to do it. Then he was responsible for basically uh, building Hendry Hall, who was named after one of the priests uh, who had been one of the rectors there. And that was a low building. And then long the late in the 60s, they ended up building what is current the current structure at Trinity uh, Parish, Trinity Episcopal Par Parish, which has two stories. It had, you know, and it, and it was built in sort of the Spanish architectural style. Uh, so what he built then was was there. Also, they had acquired the property that was just south, was a building that was called a Loa House. Uh, over the years, the Loa House eventually was demolished, and that became the parking lot for Trinity. Uh, but anyway, but during the time he was there, there were a lot of things that were initiated uh, during the time he was there. And so um, one of the things they brought from South Carolina was the, the rocking of the cradle for newborn babies who were born. So one Sunday they would do that at the, at the family service. Um, but there were just a lot of things that were built up during that time when he was there. And I can't even think of a lot of them, but. Oh, I know, one of, them. one of them was the stained glass windows in the church. It seems that uh, some of the windows were put in by a German stained glass man who his son one day came by to see, to visit the windows that had been put in American churches. And all of a sudden they noticed that, well, there were a lot of, church, a lot of windows that did not have basically any kind of design on the stained glass windows. So, he started a program that and people could do memorials and dedicate to people. And before he left in 1964, all but one of the windows were finished, completed during that time. Um, there were a lot of other structural things that would have been done during that time as well. But basically it was just, it, it was a very, very different community back then. And you also had a lot of, um, conversations with sort of the mainstream churches and clergy and ministerial alliance and so he was involved with things like Rotary Club you know he's been president president of that and president of the ministerial alliance and just just a number of other things but one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was a situation as most people are aware and a lot of people are not aware there was a lot of civil rights that were going on in the city of St. Augustine and there are a number of books that have been written about that. Um, and what would happen is that there were a lot of marches and people talk about the marches, but there were also on Sundays, there were people that wanted to come and worship in the white churches, uh, which I have to admit in very segregationist St. Augustine, and in many cases, it's still very segregated. Um, there was not a lot of enthusiasm for welcoming African Americans to worship at the church. I remember talking to Barbara Vickers one time who had been active during the civil rights time and I think she was also responsible for the, um, the statue that is in the plaza uh, that does recognize the, the freedom mar marchers. And she said, well, yeah, one time she and some of her friends came in and sat down at Trinity and some of the ushers came up, who probably were vestry members, who basically threatened them, if you do not leave immediately, you will be subject to physical harm. That, of course, was not a good time to be African-American. 
in St. Augustine, as, as you can recognize. They got up and they left. Well, during the summer of 60, 63, I ended up with a summer job in New York, stayed in New York. But I came back, I flew back one weekend um, in June because my girlfriend's baby was being baptized and I was asked to be a godmother. So I flew in on Friday night and I'm with my parents on Saturday, Saturday evening, the phone rang. And Mr. Seymour, we are coming to your church tomorrow. And he said, and you will be welcome. So the next morning, my father went in earlier, my mother and I drove into church. And basically my father and his assistant, Stanley Bullock, had escorted the um, people into the church. The group was led by a Haitian Episcopal priest. I think it's Henry Stiles, if I'm just trying to remember a thing. Several women and several girls who were seated about midsection of the church. At this time, it was morning prayer. It was, we, Holy Communion was only once a month, and, and at that time, morning prayer was a regular service. Uh, and they, were, they came in, they worshiped, they worshiped during the service, and then they left. They basically were some of the first people out of the church, and as they were leaving, we had to have one photograph of, of them leaving the church. It may be the only one that really exists. It may have been New York Times. I'm not sure exactly where it came from. But they were very hurriedly rushed into a car and driven away because the media knew that the, 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 the church was going to be integrated and the Klan was there as well. Well, the, the sheriff, the sheriff was probably part of the Klan. You know, there, there were, he was deputizing, um, Hass, was it Manusi Hassi, Hassi's Posse? I, I, I'm going to get that wrong. But anyway, there were a number of people that had been deputized um, by the sheriff who were, let's say, not exactly welcoming. So you can imagine that when this happened, what happened when all of a sudden it hit the press. And believe me, it was in the press. The next, the Monday New York Times front page article about Trinity and Trinity Parish being integrated. Uh, there were several follow-up articles. Well, so the vestry was not real happy. Uh, and so Hubby Tebold, who was the publisher of the St. Augustine Record at the time, sent a letter to the bishop asking that basically my father be removed. And the bishop, what his response was he composed a letter and then he hand delivered the letter to meet with the vestry. And he basically read them the letter at wit and after he read the letter he said, and maybe instead of Charlie Seymour being removed, maybe some of you should resign from the vestry. At which point at least three did. The vestry uh, meeting was closed at that point before any others did. And you can guess sort of how things were in the community following that. Um, it was very segregated. Even though we grew up on the corner of Bridge and St. George Street, we were two blocks over from Lincolnville, which now is very gentrified. But at that time, that was the heart of the African-American community, aside from West Augustine. The, the Episcopal Church, the Diocese of the Episcopal Church, Diocese of Florida, which at that time stretched from Jacksonville to Pensacola, there were two dioceses in the whole state, had voted in 1961 to move towards integration. Unanimously had voted to move towards integration. When everybody heard about the conflict within the church, the priest of the diocese basically said, if the vestry decides they're going to cut off the salary of, of Mr. Seymour, we will give up part of our own salary so that he will not be, lose anything out of it. During the next few months, my father entertained various offers, which he got. He also got a lot of mail. The, we recovered 
some of the, the positive mail that he had gotten over, over the months, even prior to that. My mother basically probably destroyed all of the hate mail, which is unfortunate, but that, that's what happened. He entertained you know, what was going to be happening. And he was invited to go to Trinity Church in the Garden District of New Orleans to be the associate rector. It's a congregation that at that time was about 2,000 members. And they moved, the end of September, they lived through a hurricane that hit Florida. Their, their furniture, their belongings went on a moving van to New Orleans. They arrived in New Orleans and they went through a hurricane in New Orleans. <laughs> and they were staying at a hotel at the time. And finally, my mother said, well, you know, we could at least be unpacking boxes if we were in, 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 in they had a, a, an apartment on one story in a two, two family building. And so they went over and they unpacked their boxes and that's when they basically um, arrived in New Orleans. One of the members of the congregation in New Orleans basically said, you know that Seymour guy, you know what he did in St. Augustine? And uh, Canon Turner, the, who was the rector, basically said, I know, that's why I invited him. And I know that at some point during the time he was at Trinity, he was there for, oh, I think about seven, seven and a half years, and then went on to a, a, another congregation in Louisiana before retiring to St. Augustine in 1979. And basically, um, one of the things that he was looking at is they did have a church school there basically bringing African-Americans in to become students at the school. My parents returned to St. Augustine in 1979 to property, that, the only property they had ever owned in their house in their life, which was uh, property at the beach. The beach house had been converted to a year-round home. And after they arrived, there were a number of people that came up to them. Some of them apologized for their behavior that had taken place in 1964. Others basically said, the nerve of you coming back to St. Augustine. This was 15 years later. <clears throat> Since then, obviously, well, my, my father died in 04, my mother died in 08. But basically, you can try to understand how they might have felt even coming back. But St. Augustine was where they, they had been for so many years and was really the longest time they had had together aside in Louisiana um, at one location. And coming back, they had a lot of friends and a lot of whatever. And of course, as family members, we love being able to come back to the beach, <laughs> bring children, bring grandchildren, et cetera. But, uh, I think of my parents often, uh, and I am very proud of what my father, my father did. However, my brother, who lives here, might say, you know, he's not a hero. And I'm thinking, but he is. He was not an activist. He was not someone who would have actively gone out. He would not have marched. He would not have done a lot of these things that other people would do. <coughs> But he knew what was right, and he was raised in a family with seven siblings and parents that were basically the heart and soul of Knoxville, Tennessee. My grandfather was a lawyer, very respected lawyer. They both were very active in the church. My grandmother, I think, had done everything in the church you could as a woman. And when you are raised in this type of a family where the house was open to whoever his, he or his brothers or sisters brought home for dinner, you know, because the cook never knew how many people were going to be <laughs> eating dinner with them. It might be 10 if all the family was there. It might be 20. So it was just this kind of household that he was raised in that made him feel more welcoming to other people uh, during his life. And I'm just glad to say that I'm proud to use my father. Thank you so much for sharing that very powerful story. Um, if you don't mind, I do want to go back to certain elements to kind of ask sure. a little more detail. Um, 
so like you mentioned, it, he, your you, your father wasn't an activist, wasn't somebody that would march, mm -hmm. and the reason that you think he he did do this was because of the family he was raised in. Um, I imagine that during that time there was a lot of very tough opposition where it would have been easier for him, for him to just go with the status quo. Do you know if there was any defining moment, event, anything that prompted him to take that stand, even knowing kind of the response he would receive? The nice thing about the Episcopal Church is, maybe not in its entirety, is that it's been more welcoming. There was an incident in April, which if you read in the books, you'll know that Mrs. Peabody, who was the wife of the bishop and the mother of the governor, I just have to try and get them straight, came to St. Augustine. And I have a story about this, which is very interesting. She came to St. Augustine in order to get arrested. She came in right after Easter. And she also brought the wife of the suffragan bishop, who was African-American, but not obviously African-American. And she would go and she would sit, they, she would go to a restaurant, they would order food, and then she'd say, Of course, you know she's African American. This is Mrs. Peabody. She was very outgoing. And I think she came, I think she came from a lot of wealth. I think, I don't remember exactly which family, but I, she, she was somebody who was raised in, in that manner. And they, they, she came in with some other people to a service a weekly service that was being held. And the service actually was not held. But it was basically, she came in and then she ended up meeting with, meeting with my father and talking to him. And, I, and as I, he, he basically might be termed a reluctant participant in a lot of this, but at that time, it was sort of like he had no notice she was coming, then all of a sudden she was coming. She was making a big deal about it. And then some of the stories I've heard, and even one of the people doing black history said, and he told her that the, we don't allow African Americans to worship here. I heard that some, when I was on the tour. And I said, I'm sorry, you're talking about my father. He would never have ever said that. I did hear from somebody else that at one worship service, there was another one in addition to the one in June that African Americans had worship. But you're, talk, you're talking about a very different time in history and this was also the beginning of the civil rights. And a lot of the feelings from the white population was, who were they to come in and tell us what to do and how to do it? It's sort of like, you know, we know better for, for what we're doing, even though it was not the right thing to do. And one of the stories that you would read about is that after they passed the civil rights legislation, and, and Martin Luther King had been in and out of St. Augustine, and Andrew Young, and lots of other people, and there are three or four or maybe more books that are written by about the, this particular time. He was given, the, uh, Martin Luther King was given the assurance that following the passage of the Civil Rights Bill, and he was allowed to eat at the Monson Ho dining room after the bill was passed, where he had been trying to eat before the bill was passed. And he, and he has said that St. Augustine was the most difficult place. The city fathers agreed to have meetings with members of the African community, the, Dr. Haling specifically, and some others, to meet with the city fathers. And you know what their meeting consists of? A secretary, a tape recorder, and, and them. So they actually refused to come in and meet with, with them. So this, it's, it's a very unfortunate history of what, what has happened uh, during that time, but it's just that Sometimes the right thing needs to be done, and it finally happened in St. Augustine. Finally, finally. But unfortunately, there's still a lot of segregation, and one of the things that they will say is the most segregated place in America is Sunday morning in the churches. <laughs>
and I think that's very true. Wow. I know you mentioned earlier in your interview um, how you even consider St. Augustine to be very segregated now. Do you think you can, and right now you're mentioning it in reference to churches, do you think you can talk a little bit more about that? I think there are probably some people that could talk about it better than I can. Um, one of the things that is happening, and I, I'll be political about this, at the state level, is they are trying to erase black history. We have a governor, we have a legislature that is going in lockstep with the governor, and they don't want the history to be known. They don't want the history to be known, how difficult it was. They don't want, they have no empathy to know what it's like to walk in somebody else's shoes. And having grown up in St. Augustine, as I said, it was very segregated. I mean, I saw the water fountains, white and colored. I saw the restrooms, white and colored. I know, you know, I wasn't here when they were trying to get a, a hot dog or, or a Coke at, you know, at Woolworth's counter, which actually that building is owned by Trinity Parish, Trinity Episcopal Parish, by the way. That whole block is owned by them all the way over to Avalee Street. Um, but, you know, of course, you can see in the Lincoln Film Museum, you can see the counter where they, where they sat, or part of the counter where they sat. Um, you have got within this community. You've got people that were you part. Did, did, were you part of the civil rights? And if you weren't, then why do I need to talk to you? Or what are you doing about this? There, you also had you know different groups of people from different areas that didn't always work together. But I, then again. In the white community, <laughs> that's very true as well. But it, it's it's that just getting things done in this county can be difficult. West Augustine, in specific, needs new needs sewers running all the way through it. They need to get rid of the septic tanks. Um, there are a lot of businesses that don't go in because of that. They've been able to get you know like Dollar General and you know a few other local things going, but. You need to have the support of the city, which I think they do. You need to have the support of the county. You need to have the support of the states. And only recently, there's a group called Good Trouble that started through the Compassion of St. Augustine, and they're working with Greg White and others in West Augustine and trying to get make things happen. They were able to get a large amount of money dedicated to specifically West Augustine that would help with the sewers, that would help towards getting a medical clinic there, that would help towards making it a better place for the residents to live in. So, yeah, it's, it's there, it's there. It's, it may be more subtle, but it's there, and we all just need to do, be more proactive in reaching out to make sure that things are better for everybody. Yes. Well, my final question for you, um, just really quickly, I was gonna ask, um, you mentioned that you see your father as a hero. So do you feel a responsibility to continue in his legacy, specifically as it relates to civil rights, or um, are you more of an observer of history? Um, what, what's your position in that? Well, I spent 32 years in Europe. The only politics I was involved in in Europe was in the Episcopal Church, to be honest. And it was only then where you could start, you could be American abroad and vote. As soon as I came back to St. Augustine, the first thing I did, I got involved with the Democratic Party. I mean, you might have figured out I'm a Democrat. I ended up working in the office. I ended up becoming the secretary of the party. I was office manager. I helped, helped to get the first office established and was chair of the party for eight years before stepping down two years ago. Other things that I'm involved with, I started the St. Augustine Democratic Club. I'm involved with Compassionate St. Augustine and have been off and on since they were started in 2015. 
And I also have put on a new hat, which is as chair of the St. Augustine Music Festival that offers free concerts in the community at the Cathedral Basilica downtown, beautiful setting. Um, but of course, that means we have to raise a lot of money so that we can do the concerts. Um, personally, um, people call me nice. <laughs> I like to reach out to people when they have needs, and I, I, I like to just be involved. And sometimes I've ended up heading up groups, but I've also enjoyed being supporting of groups most of my life. And I think a lot of that came from both my parents. My, my mother was involved in everything. <laughs> you know, parent-teacher group, um, women's exchange, yeah, you, you name it. Um, and just, I feel that hospitality is, is just a part of my being from the life that I've led and the parents that I had. All right, thank you so much. Um, is there anything that you would like to speak on that we didn't ask you about, like to give you the space to? As my husband would say, I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've said enough. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much. Um, and yeah, that's the end of the interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.